Muy buenas tardes a todos. Vamos a estar ofreciendo interpretación simultánea al inglés y español durante esta reunión. Si desea escuchar la interpretación en inglés o español, haga clic en el botón de interpretación en la parte inferior derecha de la pantalla Zoom. Verá un icono en forma de globo terráqueo que aparecerá justo después de estas instrucciones. Si nos acompaña por medio de la aplicación Zoom para teléfonos inteligentes, seleccione su idioma haciendo clic en donde dice más o en los tres puntos en la esquina inferior derecha de la pantalla. Seleccione la eh, interpretación del idioma, después elija español o inglés y haga clic en donde dice listo. Si desea escuchar solo al intérprete y no a los presentadores, asegúrese de hacer clic en donde dice silenciar el audio original. Good afternoon. We'll be offering simultaneous interpretation in English and Spanish during this meeting. If you wish to hear the speakers in English or Spanish, please click the interpretation button at the bottom right corner of your Zoom screen. You will see a globe icon that will appear right after these instructions. If you're joining us <clears throat> via the smartphone app, select your language by clicking more or the three dots in the bottom right corner of your Zoom screen. Select language interpretation, then choose English or Spanish and click done. If you wish to hear only the interpreter and not the original speakers, be sure to click mute original audio. Thank you. Good evening, thank you for joining us for our parent university. This evening's topic is going to be on behavior management during school break. My name is Natalie Lucia Hayes and I am AEA's board certified behavior analyst. I'm here with. Uh, my name is Alyssa Sottinger. I'm the registered behavior technician here at AEA and we both support middle school and elementary school. Um, so these are the objectives for our presentation today. We're going to be reviewing some proactive behavior strategies, um, things to avoid, the behavior escalation cycle, and some do's and don'ts for behavior escalation. Um, so during school breaks, uh, there will be increased in unstructured time, loss of familiar routine, less cognitive stimulation for your kiddo, excessive energy, and increased time on devices. Um, so we wanted to get some of the parents' inputs. What are some challenging behaviors that you see with your kids at home during school breaks? If you feel welcome to share. A lot of parents have to run notes. Um, I want this. Something very, very common. Sharing. Anything else? Definitely increased uh, screen time. So it's a challenge. Yeah. I think just the fact that they're not entertained every minute of the day is hard. For my kids, they want to sleep in. And it's nice, but it it's nice, but then it like it really like messes with their like their internal clock. And then everything is just backed up or like then they don't want to eat at a certain time. And I'm like, we need to stay on a schedule um, or keep the routines and yeah, that's for me, that's the hard part. So I'm like, oh. As a parent, I can agree with you as well. Increased screen time or always getting that attention or activities to do. So our goal is to hopefully provide you with some strategies that you can use at home with your kiddos. And hopefully we can support you during those times that those behaviors or tantrums do occur. Um, so number one is being proactive. Um, and what are what does that look like? Um, so what are changes or activities that might be difficult for your child? Are there new people coming around? Um, typically during breaks, maybe you'll have family coming around, more friends coming around, um, new foods, um, if you're traveling. Um, how, can you make, how can you make these easier for your child? And also asking for your child's input on what they might make easier for them. <laughs> <laughs> <Fill in the. laughs> Um, some behavior strategies that we are going to go over to use at home um, are priming, setting expectations, schedules, uh, priming before big transitions, giving choices, avoiding those power struggles, um, providing them functional communication, positive directives, and praise. 
And in the next slides, we're going to go look further into details of what those look like. So with priming, um, some things to consider, um, giving your child plenty of notice on routines or changes, um, new expectations, people visiting, et cetera, adding big events or changes to the calendar. Sometimes it's really helpful to give your child um, something visual for them to see instead of just verbally telling them. Um, giving reminders again before the event or the change will happen and reminding your child of what strategies you will, will be using with them to make these easier for them. So when you prime your kid up at home, that's giving them sometimes a warning before things or just giving them enough notice of changes that are occurring. Um, this is something useful to use with your child if uh, big changes in routine are a struggle for them or they've expressed like, oh, I don't like going to new places. There's too many faces. Just talking them through that ahead of time can be helpful for them. Um, setting realistic expectations. So keep consistent expectations during those school breaks. Uh, discuss the expectations with your children. Don't expect them to know what they are without discussing them. Um, for example, my kiddos at home, we try not to have screen time during the school week, but on the weekends they have screen time. Um, during school breaks, that's something we discuss before going into the break. How much time do they, do they have on an iPad or their TV? Um, so that's something that you can discuss with them during those breaks so they're aware of what those rules are. Um, because if my husband comes home and is like, oh, turn off the TV, like, no, we talk with mommy, he's making sure you have those expectations with your entire family. Um, because as a kiddo, being told, oh, you get to watch TV, and then an adult comes in and turns it off, mm -hmm. that's going to set a tantrum or have them be upset. And rightfully so, because maybe mom or grandma let them know, hey, you can watch TV until I tell you to turn it off. Um, and then modify those expectations as needed. So things are going to come up, and you're going to have to talk with them and let them know, hey, I know we were supposed to watch TV, this movie, till five o'clock, but we got to go to brother soccer practice, or we're going to go grab dinner with the family instead. Um, so just doing your best to support them when those changes do occur unexpectedly. Um, creating a daily schedule, as I mentioned, is really important for our kiddos. Um, writing it down and reviewing it with them in the mornings, um, that helps prime them for their day. Um, interspersed preferred and non-preferred activities. Um, if we're constantly giving some non-preferred activities, that's also going to elicit um, behaviors. So make sure that we're filling their, their cup up with preferred activities and non-preferred activities. Um, scheduling in downtime um, and time for electronics, as Natalie discussed, and including time for movement, creativity, relaxation, and pro productivity. As you had mentioned, um, boredom is very common for our kids when they're not in school. So making sure that we're stimulating their minds, keeping them occupied with different activities um, also helps with that. So priming before transitions. So these are some ways you can prime um, when you are transitioning at home. I'm using a timer. You can use a timer on your phone. My family likes to use Alexa. Um, even like setting your smartwatch to go off and that can be either like, hey, in 15 minutes, we're gonna go get our outside clothes on and we're gonna you know, walk to the park. Or in 15 minutes, we're gonna turn off the TV. I'm giving them verbal warnings. So though you put on a timer, letting them know, hey, we have five minutes left on that timer. And then circling back in a minute or two, letting them know, hey, the timer's gonna go off. We're gonna get ready to head to the market. Um, let them know when they can engage with preferred items again. So as we've shared, screen time is a big, big one. So let them know like, hey, we're gonna turn off right now, but you can get it this evening, or we're going to be able to come back and finish the show at a later time. Um, letting them know that it's in sight again, that'll keep them engaged and motivated for when it's they're going to have access to it. Um, offer opportunities to request more time. Um, so if you know it's really difficult to get them off of the iPad, you can set that timer and set it a little earlier than you expect, and then help them model say, can I have a few more minutes, and then honor that so they learn to ask for more time appropriately with that activity mm -hmm. or that item. Um, and then another great uh, primer that you can use are first then statements. Um, so that can be first we're going to brush your teeth, then you can watch TV. First we're going to eat breakfast, then we can go ride our bikes. So letting them know what um, they, comes next or what they're maybe motivated or excited for. Expectation of what you're expecting from them so that they can yes. get their reward. Exactly. That's exactly the perfect example of a first then. So they know they're still going to be able to access it later, but they have to first do this small task at home in order to get into that. 
One thing that I also have noticed this year, because I have now two kids at AEA, one in kinder, one in second, is um, instead of telling them like, okay, you only have 15 minutes left mm -hmm. until you have to get in the shower. I started asking them, how much time do you think you need for you to be done with this activity? So you could get ready to take a shower. And usually what I'm going to give them is more than what they tell me they need. So, you know, my daughter will say like, I need 10 minutes. And I'm like, in my head, I think, great. Because I was thinking I was going to give you 20, but now you told me 10, which works out even better. So I started doing that where I ask them, how much time do you think you need? And then they give me a number and I make sure that they are, I do, I put the timer on. And then they're accountable because they chose that number. I didn't. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's a great way to have them advocate for their needs and wants. And that's mm -hmm. something we work on throughout their entire life is speak up when there is a need or if something's going wrong. And that's a great opportunity to do that. Thank you for sharing that mm -hmm. one. So going into what Monica was saying, the power of choice. <laughs> um, providing choices to our children gives them a sense of control over their environment, their schedule, and their lives. Um, there are so many opportunities um, to embed more choices throughout the day. Um, choices should always reference two to three options. And I really want to emphasize acceptable options. If we're offering choices that are not acceptable for our kids, we don't want to provide those choices. We want it to be something that's achievable and manageable for them. And avoid open-ended choices such as what should we do today? So always giving them those two to three choices. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so offering two, two to three choices during activities and tasks throughout the day will help your child have a sense of control over their time. Um, so maybe you can say, I'm going to pick three activities. What two activities would you like to do today? Um, giving them choices will decrease the arguing and negotiating and refusals, those tantrums that you may see. And then those choices can include places to go, activities to do at home, time limits, and choices within those activities that they are able to do. So avoiding power struggles. Um, you always want to stay calm and keep a neutral voice. Um, we know that once we start feeling ourselves getting escalated, that's only going to portray that onto your child. So re remember to have your own kind of just then uh, demeanor when you're having these uh, power struggles with your children. Being mindful of your body language, um, getting on your child's eye level if you have littles. Um, picking your battles. You may decide to ignore small inappropriate behaviors that are harmless and communicate with other adults in the environment so that everyone is responding consistently to all the behaviors. That leaves less confusion. That's so hard, especially I know yeah. if Nana's in town, <laughs> Nana allows them to get away with a few more things. So having those discussions before other family members are there or supporting you with your kiddos at home, I'm letting them know. Yeah, I love Nana, but there's no more candy. This is how we run this shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, avoiding power struggles. So avoid getting hooked into those arguments and negotiations um, as your kiddos are going to learn, that, hey, if I can continue going back and forth, maybe I'll get more out of it. Um, offer your child a two-part choice of when they are verbally re resisting. So your choices are um, to go brush your teeth or get your pajamas on. Let me know which one you want to choose first. Um, so giving them those two options of what you know are acceptable, and they're going to have to decide which one they want to do first. Um, leave the behaviors in the past. So as soon as the incident is over, move on and don't remind your child of his or her inappropriate behaviors. And then don't speak to other adults about your child's problems behaviors in front of them. And we don't want to shame them when, you know, my aunt calls, oh, I just dealt with my daughter. She had a tantrum because she wasn't ready to take a shower. Can you believe it? It happened again. Um, they are aware and they hear those things and then they may internalize those things more. Um, so once that behavior is over, we're moving on to the next thing. We're just going to continue to move forward and reset and move on with our day. I like that you said the leave it in the past because that's something that I will typically use their past behavior to say, remember when that happened? Like, let's not do that again. And I never thought about it that way. But then my kindergartner, he will bring it up and, and say, and say and talk about the behavior in a negative way. And now I'm like, well, that's because I'm always reminding him of it. So 
thanks for saying that because I never thought about it that way. They might hold on to that. And yeah. That's something not. I found if I bring up previous behaviors, they do it back to me. Oh. So like if I mm -hmm. if I broke something, like I stayed up late one night, then they remind me about that. Oh, that's, yep. That's that. the strategy they pick up pretty quick. <laughs> Very quick. Cool. A friend one time said like, if you're gonna go to grandma's house. Don't tell them, we're not going to go to grandma's house if you don't do this because you know you're eventually going to go. So don't make that false don't promise. False yeah. Yeah. That's something we're going to talk about. So, yeah. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Right. We're not going to go there if you don't do this. And then you end up going there anyway. So they're going to be like, I don't have to do it. <laughs> yeah, you're setting yourself up for failures. Um, so as we know, behavior is communication, no matter the form of uh, or intensity of the behavior is, our child is always trying to communicate with us. If your child is exhibiting problem behavior, they're trying to communicate something and do not have the skills to self-regulate um, or do it effectively. Your child may be trying to communicate that they're feeling overwhelmed or dysregulated, they're looking for attention, they're trying to avoid something unpleasant or they need more time for transitioning. So we're going to talk about functional communication. Functional communication is the ability to communicate one's feelings and basic needs effectively. So as Miss Alyssa shared, um, if your child is having a tantrum or they're engaging in that power struggle, they're trying to communicate something to you. And our goal is to provide them the opportunity to get that need met appropriately or in a more uh, manner that is acceptable in your home. So this is typically a skill deficit for a child with challenging behaviors. Um, when children learn functional communication, they may no longer demonstrate those challenging behaviors. And initially, we may have to explicitly teach that skill to them. We'll talk more about that. So when teaching functional communication, we want to verbally prompt the use of functional communication, the phrase that we're looking for, uh, immediately praise and reinforce the use of their words. And then this will increase your child's future of communicating in replacement of the problem behavior. So an example of functional communication would be, um, since we are on the topic of technology. I can't get off of it right now. So if we are going to transition off the iPad and your child may throw the iPad, start screaming, yelling no, or start crying, we want to provide them the opportunity to share or state, can I have more time, please? Or I'm not ready yet. And then our goal is to provide them with that prompt and that they will eventually begin to use it. And we want to honor that. So they learn, if I use my words appropriately, I'm going to get access to my iPad. And then I know I have access and now my mom or dad just gonna let me know Thanks for using your words. You have five more minutes, then we have to get off of it. One thing that I've noticed that uh, is a really good strategy for this is modeling that language for them because sometimes when they're in those escalated moments, they're not able to form those words. So modeling to them like, oh, like just literally modeling to them what's happening in that situation. Oh, it seems like, you know, you're upset that we don't want to get off the iPad. Maybe you can ask me for more time um, and letting them know that that's the kind of language that they can use appropriately to have access to whatever that is. Some examples of a functional communication are, can I have more time, please? Um, can we do something else instead? I'm feeling overwhelmed and I need a break. So these are the phrases that we would model for them in times of, you know, this. they're engaging in that behavior you're struggling with at home. Um, so these are something that you can narrate as they're engaging in that behavior. Um, for example, if you're traveling somewhere new and you're going to go uh, have dinner with a lot of new people, um, my daughter will begin to cry. And I will say, oh, you can see that you're feeling overwhelmed, that maybe you need a break or you need more time before we go into the restaurant. So let's take a few deep breaths together, then we're gonna go inside. Um, can we do something else instead? Um, if the task is to go clean up your toys, can I do something else instead? Okay, well, let's go take a bath instead. Or what else do we have on our list that we need to get, do, get done? And then we can come back to this activity later. Um, using positive directives. You want to use language that makes it clear for your child and what they should be doing and not what they should be doing. Um, avoid using no, don't, or stop. Labeling the expectations you want to see. Use nice hands with your brother. Use inside voice when I'm on the phone. And provide behavior-specific phrase. Um, phrase a specific de desired behavior. Thank you for letting me know that you needed more time. One of the examples I like to use a lot with this is in at school, we don't want students to run in the hallways, right? But instead of saying, don't run, 
we tell them what we want them to do, please use walking feet. So I'm communicating the same exact thing, just a different way of saying it. So they're hearing what I want them to do and not what I don't want them to do. Absolutely, because that's what we're used to. Yeah, absolutely, because that's what we're used to. Mm -hmm. I always struggle at home is like, that's not available right now. Instead of like, no, you can't. Or I always, my daughter will put her finger up. No, I'm like, oh, but well, now you're coming back at me. You negotiated, uh -huh, right? So no, trying to rephrase it into something that is more appropriate or in a positive way. Um, it definitely takes time. Behavior change right. takes time for the kiddos and for ourselves as adults right. as well. It's definitely a lot of practice too of, of retraining my brain to tell them what I want them to do. Practice. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Well, well think I about it. If you're if you're telling them to stop running, the last word they're gonna hear is running, right? <laughs> so you always want to tell them what they can be. That's how I try to train my brain. That's <laughs> <Run, run, laughs> <run, laughs> <laughs> <laughs> you speak like Yoda. <laughs> so the power of praise. Uh, praise the behaviors we want to see more of. Oftentimes, children are not discriminating between negative and positive praise or attention. Give them more attention or praise to the desired behaviors and less to the undesired behaviors. So letting them know what they are doing appropriately. Um, and the goal is that once they hear have that praise, you're going to continue doing that behavior because you're giving them that praise and attention for the desired behaviors. I always give my kids points. They don't know for what, but I'm just <laughs> telling them. They do something cool and I'm like, hey, you get 50 points. They're like, oh, cool. But we don't add them up for nothing. But it's always them hearing, you get points, you get points. You and get it's points. coming from you and it's yeah. something positive and exciting. So they want to keep getting that so attention from you. And... A million points already. Right? Um, we want behavior specific praise is the type of praise that helps children learn the positive behaviors and look and feel like behavior specific praise increases the likelihood children will engage in those behaviors in the future. Um, give a description of positive behavior for them and a use of authentic positive and warm tone of voice um, is best as well. So when we give a description of positive behavior, um, one thing you can do is, oh, I appreciate you putting your clothes away or thanks for putting your clothes in the hamper. I love that you put your bowl in the sink today. Um, so just giving that phrase specific and that will hopefully increase that behavior that you're looking for as well. Um, I have a question. When I have tried this strategy and one of my kids hears it, then the other kid's like, oh, so I didn't do the good thing because now you're giving her or him positive, like you're praising him for putting the bowl in the sink, but then you're not telling me. So then I get that, like, what about me? Am I the bad kid then? So, um, but it's because I want them to do the same thing. And when one of them isn't doing it, like I'm focusing on, on the one who is doing it. Uh, I don't know if, I mean, do you have any tips for that or? That's something I experienced at home as well. Yeah. I have two kids and they're always looking for my attention um, both ways. Uh, so if that does happen, I do let one of my kiddos like, hey, I know that you already put your bowl in the sink nicely. Like, I appreciate that. I'm really helping your brother right now. Um, or if not, I say, oh, don't worry, I got you. I saw you earlier when you, and then bring up something that they did positively during I the day. see that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, well, then you can say, well, that's something that mommy or daddy will work on or we'll make sure to let you know when we need something happen at home yeah. um, but also we want them to realize like hey I'm going to get attention later or when I'm doing things um, that you're looking for and sometimes they're not always going to get praise and attention and that's a realistic mm -hmm. thing at home um, but you can always acknowledge them like hey oh you're right I didn't see that I'll keep an eye out next time or yeah we have we have twins so oh, that is it's like we think one of them is fine the other one needs attention so we mm -hmm. give it to her and then the other one comes in looking for attention yeah you know, so it's like oh how do you manage both? Yeah. yeah, that is difficult. Yeah, I'm very jealous. I'll give them points. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe that's something, you, if they're both looking for your attention, I know this is a bit off topic, but carving out that time, um, for example, um, in the evening, my husband always reads with my daughter and I always read with my son. And then the next week we flip flop, depending on our schedules. So we at least make sure we have our own one on one time with each kiddo. I um, mean, that way they feel like they're getting that one on one attention and time with each parent as well. 
um, but trying to carve out certain times that you might have just for that one-to-one -one attention so they feel that their bucket is being filled with dad time or mom time. Um, and that's something you can see as the family like, oh, are they craving more of a certain parent's attention? Are they just wanting attention in general? Or uh, sometimes my son just wants attention from his sister. And I'm like, how can I help you get attention from your sister when she's like, I want to be left alone. Give me a break. Um, so those are things you can talk as a family to help support. To avoid using threats and punishment, research shows that punishment is not effective for a long-term behavior change. Each time a threat is made, there is no follow-through with it. With the mentioned consequence, learning is taking place, and eventually your child will learn that these are empty threats. Um, threats do not teach acceptable behavior, so we always want to try to focus on providing that positive praise because we're giving them empty threats as the example that you provided earlier. One thing you shared earlier, like your, I think your friend was telling you, I yeah. can't give them this threat if I can't follow through on it. Exactly. And then the kiddos are going to learn like, oh, you're not going to really take away this from me or you didn't do that last time. So I'm going to keep engaging this behavior because I know you're not going to follow through with that. Um, so now we're going to go into the escalation cycle. Uh, some of you have shared your kiddos' behaviors that you see at home, what those look like. Um, we're going to kind of go through uh, the steps of the cycle of escalation. Um, so this is a pattern, a pattern of occurring behavior during and after meltdown. Um, so we all have our own escalation cycle for our behavior, and we're going to discuss the steps in it. Um, so this will be calm, the kiddos you know, playing at home, you give them a demand to go clean up. Um, that's their trigger that sets them off. They become agitated and everyone displays their agitation differently. Um, some might start crying, shouting no. They're going to continue to accelerate. And at the peak, that's where we might see the biggest tantrum or more increased screaming and crying, throwing themselves on the floor, or even just walking away from you. So every kiddo's behaviors are different. And then we come to the de-escalation cycle. And something I really want to point out is right here, the post-crisis depletion. Um, your kiddos are gonna need time to recover. So depending on how high their peak is, they're gonna need time to re rest and recover. Is that why the graph goes below? It goes below, right? So if you have a kiddo who tantrums for 30, 40 minutes, their crisis depletion time, they might need 30 to 40 minutes to take yeah. a nap because their body's exhausted. Um, or they just need alone time, or that's when they want those snuggles to chat and kind of just feel loved again. I mean, they're loved all the time, but they want that one-on-one -on -one attention. And then we hit the recovery stage. This is where they're back to responding to you. Maybe they're sharing how they're feeling and their thoughts. I and mean, we'll go into further information on the escalation cycle. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And so that is something to be aware of. We all can get re-triggered very easily. So if we are not fully at the recovery stage and there's another demand or a transition, they're most likely going to re-trigger again. So it's best to really wait out those behaviors. Mm -hmm. Now, can we also, sorry. sorry, can we also show them something like this and let them know where they're at? Oh, or can't. I mean, if, you, so, so if they're, say, hey, I understand how you feel. You're right here. If they're really oh. visual, that's definitely oh. something that they might respond oh, to. Right, I've yeah. never thought of I'm that. Just, I wouldn't. Just so that we know what to expect from them and let them know it's okay for you to be angry or, you know. So when our kiddos are upset like that, we do want to validate them. Like, hey, I understand you're upset right now. When you're feeling better, we're going to talk more about this and how we can do it differently. Um, when they are escalated, I don't think it would be best to show them like, hey, I can see you're really upset. <laughs> they might be like, what is this paper? I'm going to rip it. I'm mad right now. Yeah. Um, but that's something like as a family, if you want to, when they're back at that recovery or you're having your family time, like, hey, I know when we get really upset, we do this. What are some other things that we can do instead of getting to this high peak or this big tantrum? Um, Maybe they have thoughts. I know my daughter shares like, I like deep breaths. And she goes to her room and she has her star deep breathing visual and she'll lay in her bed and she'll trace it with her hand. Awesome. Um, yeah, the deep breathing, the finger breathing, squeezes. My son likes squeezes. He'll be like, can I have some squeezes? I'm sad right now. Do some squeezes. Um, so there are ways that you can talk to, with your kiddos and see like what helps you, what supports you when you're upset. Um, so during an escalation, the brain enters survival mode. So our kids are in flight or flight mode, and this also can apply to us as well. Um, it shuts down the thinking part of the brain and simply reacts. This is why it's important to be proactive to prevent escalations. 
um, as we discussed earlier, priming. Priming is a huge proactive support that we can provide to our kids in hopes of preventing the escalation cycle. Um, sometimes behavior escalations are unavoidable. Once an escalation accelerates, all we can do is wait. I know that's hard. Um, but it's very important during the recovery stage that we revisit what had triggered them. Um, because as Natalie mentioned, if we're visiting these triggering topics during their escalation cycle, they're not, they're in fight or flight mode. They're not going to be able to listen to what we're trying to do. Maybe I should show them the graphs. <laughs> at the end, that's what I'm saying. At yeah. the end. <laughs> and one thing I want to preference when um, all we can do is wait it out. Um, sometimes the kiddos, they want you with them. So just because they're having a tantrum, um, your kiddos are going to respond differently. So maybe some want that alone time and they're okay with you leaving. Other kiddos need that connection, that attention. Um, so you can narrate, like, I see that you're upset. I'm here. When you need me, let me know, or I'll come back and check on you in five minutes. I'm going to be in the kitchen. Just reassuring them that you're not walking away. You're not leaving them. I'm like, hey, I'm going to give you a few minutes. And I'm going to come back and check mm -hmm. on you. Mm -hmm. That's something you can try. It, it also depends on the reason why your kid is engaging in that behavior. Are they trying to access attention from you? Or are they having a fit because they want more attention from mom? Or are they struggling with the task that was presented to them as well? But even if they are coming back and apologizing, you yes. can also ask your child, like, do you want to revisit what happened? Like, let's talk about what happened and maybe we can figure out what we can do. Um, some do's and don'ts for the escalations. Uh, don't get in your child's face. Uh, do stand relax and give your child some space. Um, don't discredit or dismiss them. Acknowledge their feelings. Empathize with them. Don't negotiate or engage in that power struggle. We can give them choices or short, concise statements. We don't want to lecture or debrief during that escalation time. Um, do we want to debrief once they are, all, are calm? And then use simple phrases or visuals with them. Um, we don't want to grab or corner them or block them. Uh, it's best to move out of the way, especially if they might engage in that physical aggression when they're throwing that tantrum or throwing themselves on the floor. Um, determine if light physical prompting can help them. Like, I'm going to go move you onto the couch right now. I can see you're upset. Um, don't react or raise their voice. We want to breathe and relax, and we want to model the behaviors that you're looking from them. For You want to model the behaviors that you want your child to engage in. What are, what are um, examples of uh, use short, concise statements? Um, so when they're engaging in that power struggle, a short, concise statement is, um, right now you need to go clean up your room. Like it's very short, simple direction, oh, yeah. that's it. Um, we don't wanna go into that power struggle because um, then they're gonna try to continue to negotiate. And it's like, okay, your direction is to clean your room. You know what that is. And then kind of like walk away from it. That's it. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't sure. I was like, I don't know what a short, concise statement would be. And it also depends on what you're requesting for that your kiddo as well. What caused the whole mm -hmm. tantrum? And, okay. And with that too, you can also use your first then statement. So we know that they're engaging in a behavior because they don't have access to something or whatever the case may be. You can let them know, like, first, let's go make your bed. Then we can. Go clean your room and then you can keep playing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a question online. Um, they're asking, what if they start being aggressive, like kicking or throwing things? So if that does occur, you want to do your best to manage the environment at home. So if there are objects that can be thrown or breakables, you want to remove them from there or remove the items, not your child. Um, I don't recommend going hands on with the kiddo because you might get hurt or that might engage in more of the physical aggression because they might not like to be touched. Um, and just giving them that space and trying to manage around them during that. Um, physical aggression at home. And also letting them know that you're going to be giving up space. Sometimes we get so caught up in the moment, we just immediately exit and leave. So letting them know, like, I'm going to give you some space right now, and then I'll come back and check. So, yeah. Thank you. I want you to, like, back by I want to say whatever. Yeah, I do the same thing. Yeah, say whatever, and then she go in the room, she's like, oh, I'm so polite, but it's fine. Are you not going to play? If I say no, it's no. And that is one thing that is difficult, um, removing an item from them. Mm -hmm. um, I always try to put it in perspective when I work with colleagues or um, in my previous jobs. Um, as an adult, how would you feel if somebody just removed something from your hands? Mm -hmm. um, like if my someone tried to steal my purse, I would 
get physically aggressive and try to get it back. And our kiddos don't know how to respond either. So if we remove something from their hands, they're most likely are going to get upset and we're gonna have an escalation. Um, the only time that we do or would recommend to remove anything is if they're going to hurt themselves or others. Mm -hmm. um, that's when we're like, you're being really unsafe. I have to take this out of your hands. Um, we can do some more first sends or timers or let them know like, okay, if you can't remove the iPad, we're gonna lose time now because you can't hand it over. Any um, examples that you can give for the acknowledging and or empathizing? Let me think here. <laughs> um, so for example, if I told my daughter, hey, you need to go clean your room and she's like super upset and crying. Hey, I know you're upset. You don't wanna clean your room. You, you can be upset, but right now that's your direction. You have to clean your room. Um, so just letting them know like it's okay to cry. It's okay to be upset. Um, and letting them know like this is something we can talk about later when you're ready. I, just, I think that one's, that one's challenging because you just want them to do what you're asking them to yeah. do. And then when they start crying or they're upset or whatever the behavior is, yeah. I have a hard time like recognizing like when do I keep going and, and reminding them of their expectation. The direction, expectation. And then when do I validate? That's and every kiddo is different. Yeah. And that's something as a parent, you're going to have to realize, like, if I continue to engage with this, are they going to continue to cry? Do they need to feel heard and acknowledged right now? Um, and then another thought that I had is when you're in that recovery stage, you can always have, when you re uh, circle back to that initial task or demand, like, hey, remember how I told you you needed to clean your room and you're really upset and you're crying? Let's identify the size of the problem. Is this a small problem, a medium problem, or a big problem? Like if there's a big problem, how do we typically respond? If there's a small problem, what are some other ways that we can respond differently? Um, so giving them those options of, hey, it's okay to be upset. What are some other ways we can be upset instead of picking or screaming? We can use our words, we can take a break. Um, but letting them know like, hey, it's okay to feel that way. But next time let's focus on expressing ourselves more appropriately. That big problem, small problem is a tricky one because what is a, Small problem to us, it might be a huge problem. Now, yeah. right? And that's something you can like map out with them over time what those problems, size of the problems look like. Let's just use, for example, say they don't like to clean their room. At this point, would it be okay to negotiate and say, okay, I'll help you clean your room, but now you help me clean the living room then? So, or would that? That's not negotiating. Out? I think that's a great way. So, that way they're still doing they're something. They're still learning, and that's where you can modify yeah. what that demand is. So for example, my daughter is like, oh, my room's too dirty. I can't clean this up. All right, I'm going to help you. Let's do one bucket at a time. At home, we have our toys and buckets. So yeah. all your Polly Pockets go in this basket. All brother's cars go in this basket. And then we do one small task at a time. And maybe that's something you have to um, accommodate them for at home. Like, OK, like let's just focus on cleaning your Polly Pockets. I'm going to put two away. Now you put two away. So modeling that with them and helping them achieve that. So and, it's okay to give them another option. Or you can even say like, all right, let's just focus on your cars. Let's put your cars away. You can come color. And then we're going to come back and see what the next step is to cleaning our room. Um, so if you need to chunk it down to be more achievable, that's great. Because we yeah. want them to be able to have those small um, achievable moments. And then we want to praise them for that. So if your overall goal is to clean your room and you need to start small with some small item, that would yeah. be the first step. And then you can shape that and over time increase it more. Um, so after a behavior escalation, wait until your child is at the recovery stage um, after post-crisis depletion. Use compliance checks. That means using simple and appropriate uh, language for their age. Some examples uh, are to pick up thrown items, ask them for a hug. Provide praise to your child once they are calm. Thank you for having a calm body. Validate your child's feelings and not their actions. I understand that can be frustrating. Next time you can ask me for help or it's hard to not get what you want sometimes. Let's try again tomorrow. And lastly, we want to follow through, uh, but be mindful of the next demands place. You might have to lower the demand or do some sort of transitional activity that might give them some behavior momentum to be able to achieve that and for a help demand or time. 
And lowering that demand is what we talked about. Like, let's yeah. just focus on putting a few items away and then we'll come back and see Instead what Instead of them feeling like that to clean the whole room, yeah. you just pick up your clothes for now. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then tuck away the toys. Yeah. One small step <laughs> yes. to make a picture of yeah. the entire room being clean. It can be overwhelming for them. That's all our presentation. <laughs> are any more questions that you guys had? I know you've had some great comments and questions. I had a question about, you mentioned interspersed preferred past activities. Could you explain what interspersed means? Yeah, so throughout the day um, at, during our breaks, my kiddos know that they have a certain amount of time of their iPad and then they have to spend time outside. So I have activities outside for them. They might have kinetic sand, water beads, and then inside the house they have more preferred activities. Um, and throughout the day I do my best to follow my schedule and say, all right, TV time is over. We're now going to go outside and play with kinetic sand. I let them know how long they're playing outside for. All right, that activity is over. Let's go ride our bikes now. So in their first thing, preferred activities throughout the day. So they're also motivated to do things as well. Sometimes they want to play more and more and more. And this is constant. They still want it. They mom, no, I did it already. Oh, mom, can we have a time? No, I said. I can't. I say no, and then she's getting mad. And she say, we just played. Oh, why you keep wanting it again? I want it again. And it's so hard to say. I keep playing, and then I keep saying no to her, and she gets mad. And sometimes you just have to walk them through that. Like, I know my kiddos want me to play with them on the floor all the time. Like, mommy has to clean kitchen and do the dishes and do laundry. Like, as an adult, mommy has other responsibilities. But when I'm done, I can come back to you and play. Or you can let them know, like, Mommy has to go do this. And in the meantime, can you please engage in this or that activity? And when I'm done, I'll come back and join you. But it is hard, especially when your kiddos want your attention all the time. <laughs> During like these half days or school breaks, we have other responsibilities that we still have to be doing as their parents and adults. So I'm just kind of walking them through those steps. I had a day off yesterday and I wrote down a list of things that I wanted to do. And we, we did them all. Oh, and I was like, nice. So I was checking them all because I was I carried that list the whole day. And I was like, so I realized, yeah, if you write it down, you'll see, okay, I got to do this next, got to do that, it's got to go here, got to go there. Yeah. <laughs> I was tired, but I was like, wow, no. got it done. I was like, yes, yeah, short list, but hey. Then even just like crossing off that item is like reinforcing to us yeah. as adult, like, oh, I got something done. It's, and let's see what I can do next. So yeah, that, that would be motivating so, to uh, certain people. Yeah, definitely setting a schedule for the day. Mm. And it, it, you got to understand, I mean, they are off, you know, so you don't have to be busy until 5 p.m. You know, let's just be busy from the morning until like two o'clock. After that, you guys play whatever you guys want to do. Mm -hmm. It's their free time, you know, so. Yeah. which mirrors a lot of the things that they do in school. Like I, we tasked the student led conferences and the teacher said, show your parents what we do in, during the day and the schedule for the day. Mm -hmm. And so I was just thinking that they do that every day at school. And if we mirror that at home during breaks, that can be helpful because they already know that's what they do during the day at school. But it is until about like, 2 p.m. because yeah. then they're yeah. they're wrapping up their day. So that makes sense to do it that way instead of having something planned all day. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's just cool to plan something the entire day. Um, and that can be helpful as well when they get ready to go back to school because they're going to be getting back to waking up at a certain time, going to bed at their bedtime, um, and then those normal routines at school again. So they're going to get used to those routines. I'm trying to get to sleep in. <laughs> still wake up. 6 a.m. <laughs> yep, I feel like on that one. <laughs> they sleep in during the weekday and sleep in yeah. and wake up early on the weekend. So. Yeah. Are you reading? <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? I was going to check with the parents and, and see if you guys have some advice. Um, I have an eight-year-old who she'll watch 50 minutes of TV or whatever. And, but all she's focused on, focused on is the five minutes that are left. So she won't like appreciate the 50 minutes she just watched, like the scale or the size of like what she got versus what we have to stop now because we're leaving. I don't know if you guys experienced this. Like, like they're really focused on not what they just had and enjoyed. So the, uh, <laughs> they're really focused on what you're taking away from yeah. what, 
It could be like a piece of cake or something. They just had a huge cake, right? But they want that last little piece. Yeah. And then they're, they're like sad. That's something I have. Mm. I don't know. You got to have any advice for that. You don't know about marriage. You don't know about marriage, maybe. Yeah, what did you say again? You got a lot more time. They're eight years old. Yeah. And they're aware of time and the concept of time. Um, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> so they know the, the show is going to be over or something. Mm -hmm. Or Dude, the worst thing is auto play. Oh, like you did the oh, filming. Yeah. So they don't know like this. I blew the these show seven minutes, over. right? Do what? The show is over. They don't realize that it's the, sh the show never ends. Yeah, it's just they. It's like oh, I don't know. Oh yeah, it automatically goes into the next episode. Five minutes. Uh, time. It sounds like it's a me problem. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I'm trying to understand. Yeah. I, they kind of have that where we're winding down for the day, and she says to me, "I didn't get to pick anything to watch today, but they they've been watching TV for like, 30, 40 minutes." Yeah. <laughs> so I try to bring up, um, "Well, what would you like to see tomorrow, or can I give you?" 10 minutes, 15 minutes of what you want to watch. And then once we're ready, you know, to go to bed, we kind of go over what she watched or what she liked. And I mean, that's how I do it. But she does get a little bit apprehensive of, I was watching TV, but it wasn't what I wanted to watch. And okay, now I need some more time okay. to see what I was going to need. Yeah, because it's like, that's it's technically not my time because I didn't right. enjoy that show. <laughs> sharing the TV. Yeah. So then now it becomes a problem of I didn't get to pick. So I want 10 more minutes of, I don't know, another show. But I just, the, the max is like 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah. And that's it. That's the show, and we we say what we liked about it, and we wrap it up. And also, if we know that the trigger for her is eight minutes coming up, you can let her know if there's something like rewarding that can happen after when the show is over. Prevent her up. Forward. <laughs> and she picks the shows. So. Uh, I, I have found it helpful to to watch a show together and discuss it together, mm -hmm. um, but I don't know. We can only do so many shows, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay. yeah. If you understand the autoplay, it gets it. <laughs> yeah, it does. Oh, no, there, there's none. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You guys did just a lot. Do you guys have this thing? Like, do you guys send an email or something? Or yeah, it, um, I'm gonna upload it onto the the parent university okay. resource page, and then the recording will also okay. be there too. So all of the parent universities that we have, if we are allowed to record it, because sometimes we have outside presenters and we're not allowed to record the parent universities, but for the most part, um, all of our in-house staff members who provide parent universities, everything is recorded and posted mm -hmm. on our website. Yeah. So we did have one like specifically for our kinder um, parents. We had a TK kinder and first grade reading parent university right before the long president's holiday. And that one was recorded. Mm -hmm. um, so everything is online on our website. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.